Hi, my name's Guy Riddihoff, and I'm one of the editors at Science Magazine. And I'm here today with Sasha Tarakovsky from the Rockefeller University in New York. And he's uh, interested in immunology and epigenetics. And I think we'll start with mimicry, Sasha, because you have a specific interest in that with regard to the way that pathogens try and take advantage of us and our biology, uh, our cellular systems. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, mimicry is pretty well known um, as a as a way for the pathogens to kind of interfere with different host functions. Mm -hmm. I think what makes our research a little bit different compared to other mimicries that has been discussed is because. Uh, it sort of we we uh, whatever what, what we study we study uh, mimicry I would say at the extreme edge of the mimicry, and so what does it mean? That it's, uh, when mimicry occurs, it reflects the effort of the pathogen to take over the host function, mm -hmm. and the nature response of the host to this effort is to change itself. So the changes are pretty. Uh, remarkable because it enables uh, host to escape the virus or bacteria and live happily after. When, when you say when you say happily, it's not quite as simple as that though, is there? Because there's a red queen involved. That, in right. So that's where I was heading to. Okay, sorry. Because uh, the red queen hypothesis uh, basically formulates that we are in a constant fight against each other. Each other means viruses, and. In, it's actually quite a, uh, it can be viewed as a much more general principle where antagonizing forces shape each other and that's why I uh, tend to think about this sort of red queen more broadly uh, because any sort of negative Im Im impact on, on multicellular organisms including human can be seen both as negative and positive so in terms of progression evolution and where we are heading not necessarily bad things are bad. Mm -hmm. uh, so the but it is the impactfulness of viruses uh, is pretty immense. But the escapism, this Larry Houdini of of, of the of the cell system is also quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. However, there is a place where changes are very not welcome. Right. And this place is an actual genome, gene sequences, and epigenome, and the core part of the epigenome is the, the, uh, the proteins called histones, as all many people know. And the histones is, is a founding unit of the chromatin, and they're extremely well conserved. So these, this conservation implies that there's really not much of an interest on the cell side to change the histone of whatever it takes actually to change histones. Mm -hmm. And there are multiple copies of histones and yet they are very conserved. So if so what we are working on, we are working on part of the mimicry that deals with this ability of viruses to imitate histone sequences. So this is a molecular mimicry we're It's a molecular about. mimicry. Right. It's a viruses viruses in general operate as molecular mimics, yes. they, they work as perfect spies that mm -hmm. uh, acquire language of a foreign state <laughs> with, with moderate accent and they try <laughs> to enter this new state and live a social life and become wives and husbands of the state. So that's not sort of unusual. But like spies, they're often detrimental to the state they, of the state. They are frequently detrimental to the state, yet they, they actually going into spy thing sort of viruses very frequently kill philbis, they're double agents, mm -hmm. so whatever good for the state, good for the virus, and vice versa. So they serve different states and so So one can go into this analogy as far as you wish. The, the thing is that uh, when viruses build these histone-like sequences and use them successfully, uh, there's a two major question emerges. First of all, Many of the viruses that do this has, have never been a part of the uh, eukaryotic system in any possible perturbation. Therefore, it's not clear how did they manage to get it. So it's clear that it's a massive selection in favor of having sequences like this. 
Secondly, if once they acquire the sequence, that generates a head-on conflict with the cell machinery because if, if virus makes a histone-like sequence and this histone is used to pressurize this, the system itself, it's natural to imagine that the system will start to resist at, by changing the sequence. You can't change the sequence. And if sequence is changed, we are going into detrimental consequences for the host. And the de detrimental means not only immediate within the lifespan of a single cell, which I don't see as a detrimental overall, mm -hmm. but it's detrimental on a long, kind of on a, on a temporal, kind of talking about the long-term consequences. So this could be detrimental because it changes the genetic setup of the cell. It changes its behavior in the long term, and that's exactly what spies like. So. It, 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 uh, in going after the histones, does that mean that the cell can't, can't in, indulge? It can't indulge in a direct red queen response because the histones are so constrained functionally? Right. It, it, maybe they can or maybe they cannot. There is no immediate experiment that can address it. Right. But what particularly excites me uh, is something which is uh, highly is related to recent studies that show that uh, the histones mutation do take place and they and when they take place the effects are pretty dramatic and so it's not that the cell death but it's uh, it's actually transformation of cell that take place and one of the cases is a study in in children brain tumors where it has been found that uh, a somatic mutation in one of the histones uh, generate some uh, enormously potent toxic species of, of the histone, which even being present in substoichiometric amount is sufficient to annihilate, so to speak, the epigenetic state of the cell. So if, it means that things like this can happen, and it means that uh, whatever causes this particular change of human uh, tumors may actually happen very frequently, or perhaps at some frequency, when viruses with these histone mimics actually enter the space and persist there for duration of time sufficient to allow this adaptation to take place. So the implication is it could cause disease and even cancer? Absolutely. And one of the mimic we are studying is a mimic that comes from a, a virus which has been all historically linked to human cancer, and particularly uh, glioblastomas. And uh, I don't say we are excited about this, but it's interesting because it uh, brings back uh, a whole history of studies where uh, many researchers hopelessly attempted to identify human viruses related to, to cancer. And we know that many viruses are linked to cancer, yet viral oncogenes are not really the driving cause of human cancer. So the idea is that if that something like MIMIC can create a pro-cancer as a epigenetic state, I think it's appealing from, let's say, scientific point of view and terrible from more sort of humane point of view. Right. So, it's, uh, so, that's, so that's why I think this queen, red queen model can take, can take as far as that goes. Can I ask you, can, can you give us a specific example of a virus that uses histone mimicry and, and just a little hint about the way, how the mechanism works? Well, I mean, so far we are somewhat aware of, of, of most primitive mechanism that deals with this histomimic, which I call competitors. Yeah. So competitors, and I hope most of it is actually will survive the tests done by different labs, operate in a very simple way. There's a lot of histone-like sequences in certain viral proteins. They overwhelm nuclear space or even nucleolar space, which is a tiny kind of st space compared to the rest of the nucleus. And uh, they carry these histone-like sequences which are able to undergo the same type of personalization modification as histone. They look pretty much histone-like. So by being overabundant, they generate sort of a trivial competitive situation when they try, they suck in the sort of regulators of transcription, and that is a competition model. So these cases are influenza, uh, and um, a yellow fever virus, which both influenza has histone H3-like sequence, and influenza means one of the influenza protein, 
that it has a very well-known capacity to suppress antiviral gene expression mm -hmm. called NS1. Right. That it has a 3 4 like sequence which does play an important role in, in this viral replication. The yellow fever is I extremely interesting because it has been known since a long time that many viruses, for some reason, like to send the core protein to the nucleus. And core protein has nothing, in the imagination of any virologist, has very little to do with the nucleus of the host because it is basically a, a some sort of a, a, a shield that uh, covers the a genetic makeup of the virus. It's, it's part it's of the a, code. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a capsule. Yes. And, uh, but yet many viruses, including hepatitis C, yellow fever, West Nile encephalitis viruses, to name maybe dozens, if not more, they core protein travels to the nucleus and actually frequently travels to nucleolus. There's no theory, tested experimentally, that explain why does it happen, what's the purpose, so no one really understands the phenomenon is known. I think what what the merits of the histomimic that it brings it to, to more mechanistic pr context, provides some sense how this interference with uh, gene function can take place, you know. But also creates a kind of framework one can try to build up better understanding of what viruses actually do in the nucleus. And so, the, it, just to get practical, what the histone mimic does is alter the transcriptional program of the host cell such that the virus is more successful in its infection. That's right, that's right. But it's, it's one need always to, to, to keep in mind that viruses have dual purposes. As much as they want to be successful, the success must be moderated by necessity to keep the host cells alive as much as you want. And, and, and that's come at the core, well, at the cost of the virus, at the cost of the host. And, perhaps some most terrible epidemics like 1918 influenza is a reflection of the system getting out of whack, yes. where viruses just went and kill instead of caring for the host. Whereas current influenza is more of a nearly a peaceful cohabitation. Nearly right. peaceful. Of course, it, one shouldn't see it this way, but... Right, because old, old, old people and, and very young people are still right, but quite we, susceptible. Right, but we need to detach from this. Uh, because it's sort of, it is very humane and very doctor-like view in the system, very anthropocentric. Mm -hmm. But in terms of our m life as a, as a human race in general, viruses and the red queen model, unfortunately, work sort of agent that not only uh, train the cells, but also they test our genotypes and the work of many people actually including my colleague jean Laura Casanova they, from Rockefeller, it showed that our genetic makeup uh, defines susceptibility to the virus in a big way. So we are dealing with a sort of so social element in this virus. So histones are the carriers of epi important epigenetic marks and you, uh, an, another aspect of your research, research is also interested in epigenetic effects specifically of what happens when a cell divides and must maintain all of the genes required to form its lineage. Uh, uh, absolutely. So we, I, I believe that our lab has sort of a unique angle, or let's say, within this sort of type of research. Because many years back we found that one of the key epigenetic regulators, namely ECH2, uh, plays a truly remarkable and highly important role in regulation of uh, cell surface receptor mediated signal, in particular in T cells. And the EZH2 is present not only in nucleus, that everyone knows, but it's also present in the cell cytosol. And there it makes a complex, and the complex look very much like the complex of the nucleus. So everyone thinks it's okay, it happens. Protein likes to multitask. I tend to think about it in a slightly different way because I think the simple multitasking is not really an explanation. So what I tend to like, sort of thinking about this, is that it is a great meaning in many of the transcription regulators being present in the, in the, in the cytoplasm, put it this way, mm -hmm. extranuclear space. It includes these H2 that be found, but there were some of the findings suggesting similar things. Then Bob Breeder lab identified oka -B, which is a critical transcription factor for B cell development as being membrane-associated protein because one of the OKB isoform 
has a meristylation side mm -hmm. that hooks it to the plasma membrane. And it turned that all of it is not just for fun, uh, but this protein presence has a signaling impact. So what I think is happening is uh, as follows, that when this we, each population of cells in our organism is highly heterogeneous, mm -hmm. and therefore they bound not only simply exist as a heterogeneous state, but they also compete with each other. And the notion of competition is highly relevant for every every system, healthy or diseased one. Competition between cells. Between the cells, body. because right. we are looking, cells need to become, it's, the, the fitness is not an absolute term, it's relative to the neighbor. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is a big issue to, to understand how this competition is regulated and many factors which have a major role in proliferation, for example, like MIC, uh, contribute tremendously to competitiveness of cells. So, and cells must compete each, with each other, so it's, that's actually something that many studies in tumor biology are, are gearing to, is to understand how competitiveness feeds into tumor growth, or better to say, how tumors could be actually not competitive enough in the first place, and therefore whatever happens kind of keeps the tumors a little bit... So, so how does it relate to the, for example, this, 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 this polycomb protein out in the cytoplasm? Right. So the, the way how I think about this, if you look at, let's say, take sort of relatively simple system, like yeah. developing T cells. So, so when T cells develop, they produce an absolute insane numbers, uh, like billions of cells. And, and of course, it's all asymmetric by default. So the polycomb protein, proteins are distributed asymmetrically between cells. And it's very predictable that if you have suboptimal amount of polycomb, you're likely to make mistakes. So therefore there should be a way to kick out, put it this kind of terrible, violent way, cells which don't have enough polycomb. So how to do it? So how cell understand that it doesn't have enough polycomb? So if it is a signaling function related to polycomb, it's pretty trivial. Because if polycomb is involved in signaling, there simply would not be enough signal coming to the cell that doesn't have enough polycomb, and, and these cells will lose a competition against cells that have enough polycomb. But it will has nothing to do with the histone methylation, epigenome function. So it's more a pruning in anticipation of bad things to happen. But signaling being more digital basically allows all these sort of things to happen in a way before bad things can happen. So that and that what I think is, is very important is one thinks about the sort of epigenetic factors. So I like and my lab will try to provide the ultimate proof for this sort of epigenetic control or signaling control of epigenetic fitness. And so that would be a way of, of ensuring less heterogeneity in populations that don't need to be heterogeneous. But population has to be heterogeneous, but this has to be heterogeneous within the constraints that don't push it beyond lineage specification. Right. So it has to stay within uh, what we can vaguely define the homeostatic limits, right. whatever it means. So I, I'd like to finish with two questions. The first is, what, what do you think, the, what's the role of science? I, for me, science functions the same way as poetry uh, or art, in any case. So I don't think science has more role than being a, a way for human to exercise their creativity. I oppose the idea of science being applied. Uh, I think the application is a natural sort of outcome of science, and that's great. So, what, so you would say you would distinguish technology or, or biotechnology from science, purely science? No, I think one can. In, I am very much in favor of invention. Yeah. I'm. An, I'm against slogans, and and uh, and I think slogans is a, is a, is a dangerous way of rubber stamping things. So. Science is a way of exercising the, the abstract thinking, and the biology, of course, is not as abstract as mathematics or physics, yet, you know, it, it is still the same sort of thing. So, the learning how life is organized around us, what are the molecules, what is the driving force, it, it's fantastic, and therefore, whatever is being learned uh, can be used to invent to design new systems, to make drugs, to create new material. I, I think it's all wonderful. 
The only thing which I don't like, I think science should stay as a science, word, one word, and this kind of joining of this word applied science, science of this sort, this, I, I think it's completely unnecessary. Science and science, and that's it, and, and one doesn't need to say, well, I'm doing applied science, or I'm doing translation science. This is all bogus. This is all bogus, because there's no translational science. It's a, trans, if you study human diseases, you're still doing science, your exercises, your abstract power, and then you want to understand how things work normally and how they may work during diseases. But you don't need to empower yourself or give you a special value by saying I'm doing translation science. That I am completely against. So, given that answer, I'll ask the, the last question, which is, what's the purpose of art? Art, well, I don't want to go into sort of lengthy discussion about this, so I had a privilege to talk about this at some interesting event. Um, it's one of the biggest contemporary art exhibition in the world called Documenta, and it happened every fifth year. And I was involved in Documenta, I would say by accident. <laughs> but this was a great event, and uh, I, I enjoyed it really, and I also had the chance to to talk about exactly this issue. And I built my talk around Red Queen model, because I think exactly this antagonism between new and old, between the system which is well adapted to something and something new coming and shake the system, is essential for code fitness, code evolution, development. So I think the purpose of art is not pleasing, but it's disturbing. And that's why I, uh, similar to viruses. So it may be detrimental, it may be painful, it can be terrible, but so are viruses. They are not fit viruses or bad viruses, commensals and so So is art. Art could be commensal surrounding us and we kind of look at it and it feeds into our pattern recognition and doesn't stir this at all. But it could be art which suddenly shakes us and sends us off course because we don't quite understand what it is. And, you know, so, for example, Malevich, who, who drew this famous black square at the beginning of the century, it, it was a perfect art virus because after all figures being drawn, after all the representational art about all this, e even, even the art of Impressionism, which felt to be a revolutionary at some point, this was a complete shock. This is a smack in the face, it's a black square, that's nothing. So, this type of art is exactly something that supports my feeling that art works basically as a virus which stimulates our cognition, imagination, and that's how it feeds into science. Not by default where images of art are similar to images of science. I think this is a boring part. So the interesting part is the, that it switches us, it generates new patterns, and since many of us live daily life by basically browsing through the habitual patterns, it just shakes us. And that's that, that why, why it is important. And that's what creates my feeling that any art is, which goes outside in a genuine way, because it reflects someone's in, 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 intuition, is, 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 is wonderful. But, you know, but so is science. As long as it's done for a good reason, with good intentions, and lack of self-promotion, it's fantastic. Sasha, uh, as a wonderful example of a scientist and an artist, it's been great talking to you. Thank you. Wonderful.